Welcome to the Treasury Update Podcast, presented by Strategic Treasurer, your source for interesting treasury news, analysis, and insights in your car, at the gym, or wherever you decide to tune in. Welcome to the Treasury Update Podcast. This is Craig Jeffrey, your host today. Our episode is called From Chaos to Clarity, Strategies for Smooth Bank Integration. And I have two special guests, one in the studio with me. It's Mark O'Toole from Fides and remotely, Kelly Carpenter from AES. Welcome to the podcast, Kelly and Mark. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you for having me. Well, before we get into the questions today, and I'll start with you, Kelly, um, I, I just love if both of you could give a little bit of an overview about your current role and responsibilities to just keep the audience informed. Sure. So I am the senior treasury manager for AES. The AES Corporation is a Fortune 500 global energy company that operates on four continents. We have 127 generation facilities with approximately 32,000 gross megawatts in pipeline or operation. And that's comprised of a mix of good natural gas, renewables such as wind, solar, battery, and traditional thermal sources. We have six utility companies with 2.6 million customers, about 9,000 employees. And as of the end of 2021, we had 11.1 billion in total revenues. Today, I am based in Arlington, Virginia at our corporate office. We have a hybrid treasury function. So I have oversight of our treasury teams in these other regions on these four continents uh, with most of our operations centralized in the United States across our renewables businesses as well as our two utilities. Yeah, hi, I'm, my name is Mark O'Toole. I work for Fides Treasury Services. I head up their sales and partnership here in the Americas. Um, I've been in the treasury space now for nearly 17 years or thereabouts. I know, Craig, you and I have worked together in past lifetimes at other companies. I've worked for a lot of the uh, major TMS companies uh, on the software side. So it's been very sort of interesting last five, 10 years, just watching the developments within the space. But with Fides specifically, what we focus on is multi-bank connectivity. We're one of the largest providers in the world that, and a trusted partner to over about 3,400 clients that use our services, both for bank balance reports cash management liquidity and the payment side of things and a big value add I think is just our ability to connect to over 13,000 uh, banks across the globe so for companies like AES or any other large or small corporation that is working with smaller banks maybe banks that are not on SWIFT uh, banks on SWIFT banks maybe on different channels like EBIX um, are able to utilize our services and so that's uh, kind of what we do. I think it's great for everybody to know the background and the companies that uh, people work for, whether it's a provider, a bank, whether it's a, a treasury professional, this helps enrich the conversation. But let's let's get into the topic. I think for background, I know we're talking about from chaos to clarity and strategies for smooth bank integration. That's the, that's the, the broad theme. That's our episode title. I'm not sure who would like to go first, but what I would like to talk about first would be what are you seeing in terms of changes in finance, what changes you've seen over the past five and 15 years? I mean, thinking back 15 years, maybe, you know, more than 10 and then maybe five years, how has that changed to today? I guess I want the answer to maybe touch on some of these lenses, expectations for speed, you know, responsiveness, whether it's information reporting or how how payments uh, occur, comprehensiveness, if we're talking about visibility, how comprehensive does the company expect to be able to see like where is all our money where some of our money you know by bank is it just major activities or security how has that changed i know that's changed both of you have mentioned some of that and then the ability to adapt and shift you know it could be with relationships or with technology yeah, uh, certainly over the last five years, from from a vendor and a technology perspective, we're certainly seeing major shifts in, in you know speed expectations. You know, for a drive for real time visibility into your cash and your positions and your liquidity. So there is an expectation there for faster and more efficient payments, and that's definitely increased. And that's also also been driven by advances in technology such as real time payments and APIs and the blockchain to be able to enable a lot of that. 
the move to real time, is it people are demanding this real time or instantaneous view, or is it just a move towards faster? How would you describe that? If you look at certainly from what we see in a before and after, even today, you know, for companies that are maybe not connected or using technology for their bank automation and visibility around cash, those customers are doing things very manually. If you're a company that's going in and you're the treasurer on the cash team and you're going into each portal for each of the banks that you have and you're downloading statements and then you're taking those statements and then you're parsing them out and you're putting them on a spreadsheet and then you're consolidating that spreadsheet and you're sending it over to HQ. By the time all of that gets done, that's not very real time. So if you're if you're hungry for that data now, because I need to make decisions on it, whether they be investment decisions or I'm going to make acquisitions or whatever, I'd like that real term and real time visibility into those cash. That's one aspect of it. That's even setting aside the payments component of that. One could argue not everybody needs real time payments. I mean, if you're Uber or one of the food apps, um, the delivery options, the ability to be able to make those payments to those type of workers is, is a great benefit. But not everybody in the outside of wire transfers, they have the ability to do quicker payments, but do they need it instantaneously from a B2B perspective? Not always. So you can sort of make arguments on both sides of that. I'm thinking about payments on that too. Mark made a really good point that it really depends. So for AES, we see a mix of need for speed. <laughs> and we tend to be a little bit on the slower side when it comes to, um, we're usually paying smaller suppliers if it's our utilities. And if we're talking about capital expenditures, we typically have a lead time to anticipate those payments. So that real, like, let me tap your phone type situation isn't necessarily what you know, we're talking about. So I don't see that as much in uh, within AES. However, there are small use cases where I have seen our utility customers want to be paid faster. And that is something that I've heard peer companies talk about how do they, if there's a deposit refund, for example, when a, a utility customer signs up initially for elect, electric service, they have to pay a deposit that stays you know, with the company for an X number of time for regulatory reasons, it earns interest. And then at the end of that term, when we owe that money back to the customer, what is the best way to send that back? So real-time payment in that situation, which it's their smaller dollar value, and I'd see that being more appropriate, but I just don't see it taking off as much as say like an Uber would use something in that situation. You know, if you're making a, a wire payment, um, you know, the ability to be able to get an acknowledgement of that or where, where, where is the payment in that process or did it hit and can I easily then reconcile that, you know, in my accounts, you know, that, that's where I think technology comes in and helps it even enable that process from a B2B perspective. Yeah. So, I mean, if, you, if we think back five years or 15 years, 15 years ago, I don't know if there were still being statements that included, um, you know, paper items coming back. Maybe that was 20 years ago. Like that changed dramatically to now everything's everything's been online probably for 15 years or so. You know, on the consumer side, individual side, now it's if my kids owe me money or I owe them money, you, you sell something, it's like instantaneous. But not everything has to be instant. But I don't know of anything for information and payments where we're like, the same is always fine, or it may be fine for a while, but it's everything tends to be the same or move faster. Like there's a there's a requirement for faster analysis, maybe not instant, but but definitely quicker. Yeah, d quicker, sure, and then that's balanced out by security and compliance and regulations around that. I mean, you know, I, I, even. If you take Zelle, I, I've used Zelle as well. I, wasn't there an incident there last week where there was a bit of a security, some security issues necessarily with, with some of these applications, Venmo the same. So, you know, less less security, but certainly more convenience. And certainly for from a consumer perspective, that's great and seems to work, work well enough. Uh, but when you're dealing, you know, with large corporations with huge balances and lots of cash and many banks, you know, I think security around and, and the compliance around making those payments and, and control, being able to control who makes those payments, you know, is very paramount to be able to operate and protect the cash that you have, right? 
One other comment I could have made at the outset is, you know, everybody's opinion is their own, not necessarily those of their employers. This is just a dialogue around this, right. so, uh, which is good. And if, and if anybody wants to say, no, these are the opinions of their companies, feel free to jump in. Kelly, any comments on the uh, security side? Like, how has that changed over time? Mark Mark brought us into that topic, and maybe uh, you could uh, continue that. I'll back up a little bit more about my history. So I've been in Treasury for in some way or <laughs> way or capacity for almost 20 years. So I worked in the insurance industry and retail and now energy, which seems to be the most complex or at least there's so many layers and different segments to, to really understand um, their exceptions for the speed of reporting, for example, or the need for a type of payment. But if we look at security, over the last 15, I'd even go 20 years, it has changed drastically in in my experience. Starting out, I, I'll go back to speed, downloading BAI files and importing them into a, a hosted or homegrown system, treasury management system, to uh, actually being potentially uh, either hacked or fraudsters compromising our wire instructions and needing to close bank accounts. I see security being of um, utmost importance and I don't want to minimize the need for efficiency and speed. I think there's a balance that you need to have from a security perspective, both on, I'd say, either whether it's electronic bank statements or if it's payments, by using a either SFTP or it's just mainly a network of connections that we know are secure. We've done something one step beyond is really rationalizing our ecosystem within payments and our, our systems and um, bank reporting and that you know, by trying to minimize the number of either not just touch points, people we talk to, but those interfaces we have with third-party systems or even internally with other systems. I think when we're talking about security, we're not just talking about compromising financial information or a fraudulent wire or fraudulent checks. We're looking at the integrity of the data and in my opinion, that's that's very important as well because our job as a public company is to report accurate financial statements. So I, I would consider that a, a piece of security. And I think there's more visibility and more scrutiny than ever on companies to deliver a an efficient, an accurate, a secure message and product real time. Yeah, Kelly, I mean, you're spot on. I mean, you, you could even go beyond that and look at the, the role of Treasury and Treasurers and those teams have gone beyond just cash and liquidity. Now they're in the business of managing fraud. They're in the business of, you know, managing sanctions filtering. They're in the business of, you know, tech tech, essentially tech and compliance and regulation. And in order to do all of those things and do them well, you know, there's an over-reliance on, on technology to be able to provide that. And I think part of the challenge doing all the things that Kelly's outlining there is that if you, you know, I think it's well understood, you know, most treasury teams don't have their own dedicated IT teams. And so they have to sort of go out at the end of the year with the begging bowl. Here are the list of projects we'd like to get prioritized next year. Uh, and you hope you get on the list and then you may get some or maybe none of all the things you want to make your jobs easier to be able to manage all of those things. And, and you know, the, these things are still, you know, if you look at, you know, back back in 2016, you know, the, the, the Bangladesh banks account for them from the Fed over SWIFT was stolen, you know, $81 million, you know, so that, you know, the people could still get in there, bifurcate, you know, steal, steal money, same, same with corporate theft and everything else. And so the question there is well, what what tools can I do? Are there workflows and controls? Are there role based ways of making payments so that people have four eyed principles or have sign offs for checks over X amount of dollars, etc.? 
but but certainly everything Kelly has sort of outlined there, you know, critical to you know not just the cash and, and the liquidity management of the business and making decisions around where I can invest best the cash, but it's the protection of all of that and and ensuring you as a corporation are in compliance and and doing everything and you know from a regulatory perspective and protecting the cash. This has been an interesting discussion, not the least because I heard a new term, the begging bowl. How do you go and, and secure funds for things that are important? You know, like Kelly was saying, it's not just about efficiency. It has to be done in a secure manner. And that is a difference on, from the consumer side. It's like there's limitations on how much you send through one of those instant payment services. They limit it. And it's, it's very limited. Now what you're doing on the corporate side is millions and millions of dollars or tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. Different level of security and, and a certain level of care there. I think you guys have brought some good points. You know, and thanks for that story on the Central Bank of Bangladesh, the New York Fed. When we talk about making changes to technology, that there's, there's a cost to that. You're competing for other resources. You're bringing your begging bowl to the table. You're making a, a well-argued case. Staying put has risks to it and costs to it. Making changes can be a challenge, like, hey, it's worked so far. Why do we need to change? But maybe we can talk about pain points. And Kelly, maybe we could start with you on the, the pain points. What were some of the pain points that you would see in your career uh, for connectivity um, you know, at either commercial or, or corporate companies that you've worked for? You worked in insurance companies, energy. Maybe you could share some of those then, uh, Mark, we can continue the dialogue after. When I think about the challenges or just the problems, pain points that I've seen, I boil it down to what is the solution to the pain points are one thing you can ideally solve those, but it comes down to the simplicity of what you're doing as well as can you standardize what you're doing? When I think about these two topics, I think about Microsoft Excel work, workbooks <laughs> and spreadsheets. When you're working, working for a large global corporation with, I say hybrid, it's centralized and you know, decentralized. We have hubs and, and service centers throughout, but no one had necessarily 10 years ago, the same approach to preparing, let's say a, some, something as simple as a daily cash position. It's simple, but it's not standardized. And so if we're trying to accomplish something with uh, rolling up our global cash reports, for example, to deliver a message to our treasurer or provide information to other, S I call them SBU, strategic business units, our regions, so we can effectively kind of move cash throughout and place it, deploy it where it's needed, then using an Excel workbook may not be the fastest, efficient, most secure way of doing that. So I would say that's probably been my biggest pain point when I when I think about how can we like simplify and standardize a process. So it's prone to error. There are security limitations, like I said, and it doesn't integrate with any of our other systems. So we've moved a long way from using that very highly manual, traditional way of calculating cash to now we're using a treasury management system in combination with, uh, we use an ERP as well. Your approach was, you know, how do I simplify, standardize, and automate is a way of getting past those pain points because it's either complex, non-standard, fraught with errors, and the manual, it, it can't scale. Exactly. It's not scalable. We're essentially stuck. But to... Just within the last two years, I'll say that the pain point of everyone having their own way of doing something. Custom is great if you know how to build efficient formulas and use macros, wonderful. But what we needed was one way of doing things. So standardizing to minimize those errors loopholes and also allow the real-time reporting and visibility into our global cash position. So perfect timing is when we implemented a new treasury management system over the last couple of years, then COVID hit. And I think there was a silver lining from the lockdown of COVID-19. And forgive me if I feel like everyone is talking and they always bring this up. It was a very traumatic period for everyone, I believe. But it really helped us propel. And I, I 
our peers as well, especially our utilities, the businesses that were traditionally paper-based and paper-focused into this more modern age of automation, enhanced connectivity and uh, digital payments and financial reporting solutions. Influencing the right people to embrace these new perspectives and views on technology, even the new technology. Like who, who can see the bigger picture, take a step back and say, okay, this is the way that we've always done things. It's working, but is it ideal? And are we really getting the results that we want? Are we getting that real-time reporting? Are we having faster, more secure payments instead of somebody typing in numbers in an Excel spreadsheet or logging into a bank portal and entering a payment manually without say some sort of template or repeating instruction. There's a lot of value in standardizing and simplifying what you're doing. I'd say overall, our pain points is just, you know, looking at the traditional way of doing things and trying to think outside the box. I think that's a challenge that most people, it's, it's hard to step away when we're doing more with less to think about how to reframe and change and do something new as well as incorporate where the treasury space is going. How do you integrate all of that together to create something that actually works and it's safe and secure and standard? Safe, secure, standard, scalable, Mark. I, I know you've heard this with, uh, with other companies, uh, not just with um, AES. I mean, that's a, that's a key area. What, what, what about you? What are, what are some of the other themes that you've seen here? Well, I mean, Kelly brings up a really fascinating aspect to all of this. Who are the digital change agents inside organizations? How resistant are organizations to change? And I think we're starting to see, and I think, you know, Kelly spot on in that sense, that over COVID has forced anybody that might have been sitting or neutral in their idea of adopting technology or moving more quickly into digital transformation projects, etc., having to embrace that. You know, people were working remotely and from home, you needed to be able to to conduct your business, uh, you know, seamlessly. But also, even as people sort of retire out and you've got a whole new breed of um, graduates coming into finance and coming into treasury organizations, they're the consumer generation in a way, right? They're the guys and gals who are used to a user experience in the same way we get on a smartphone. It's real time, it's visual, it's intuitive, it's easy to use. And if you're gonna bring those kids into an organization that's you know 20 years behind in their technology, they're not gonna stick around and, and we've sort of seen evidence of that people just quit i'm out of here this yeah I, I'm, I, I'm you know it's like being handed an abacus and said here's your calculator you know if for them it's just it's not very exciting so we're definitely seeing you know that move towards that digital transformation i think kelly's right about that but more specifically you know as it relates to connectivity and particularly with the banks i mean you know one of the pain points for nearly everybody before they embrace technology is just, you know, realizing that each of the banks have a different payment format, which is always a perennial problem. So, you know, if you have an organization where you have lots of payment files in different formats, and you've got lots of banks that you want to make those payments to, you very quickly realize, well, each of those banks will only accept a certain file format. So I've got this sort of chasm between here's my payment format, whether it's coming out of my ERP or some other file that I've produced or generated from another system. Uh, how do I go about converting that into a file that the bank will accept? So that's that's one of the, the challenges. And then the conversions of trying to make those files, now you're back into that begging bowl situation with your IT department. I'm an organization, I want to scale, I'm growing, I'm adding new banks, I'm adding new accounts. I need those IT guys to be able to make those conversions in those files. And then the bigger question is, why would you is this the business you should be in is is trying to be payments experts and conversion file experts and um, when when necessary you may not have to do that interesting yeah where do you want to focus is a yeah is, is a great discussion point but you know one of the items here when we talk about making connections or having connectivity the plumbing has to take place for data to pass and whether that plumbing is you know using a secure file transfer protocol sftp mm-hmm. Whether you're using a network like Swift or through an uh, aggregator like uh, Fidesz, or whether you're using APIs, either through someone else or, or directly with your, your native system. How do you go about making decisions about what connectivity type and 
what type of, of formats, maybe richer formats versus more legacy formats that have less data. How do you go about making some of those decisions? And, you know, Kelly, I don't know if you have um, anything you want to share there on like, did you just do SFTP, you use Swift? Um, you know, were there any decision points there? And, and Mark, I'd love you to weigh in too with the, the broad multi-customer perspective. It's a good question, right? And and usually from, from FIDE's perspective, we, you know, we listen to our clients. You know, we, we try to understand what is their current banking landscape and then provide that, you know, subject matter expertise around, well, here, here are your options based on your current situation or here's what you can move to. Invariably, I mean, you have lots of choices. You have multiple channels, as you said, you know, Swift, you know, Swift channels, you've got Ebix, you've got banks that are not on Swift, what do I do there? So you have choices around, maybe you have some APIs and we'll, I'll talk a little bit, you know, the pros and cons to that. And or you build, you know, host to hosts. So from our perspective, I mean, we're, they, we're not just a Swift service bureau, we're more than that. We, you know, as I said, we connect to over 13,000 banks around the world and, and obviously not all of those banks are on Swift. So we like to meet our customer wherever they are on their journey. So whether it's all in on APIs or, or it's some combination, a hybrid combination between Swift and host to hosts because of the banking landscape they are, I think that's the important facet for that customer um, and for that company to be able to conduct its business and, and then know if they're a growing company and they want to scale, they can scale into into that technology and, and we can meet them wherever they are in the in that journey. Kelly, what about you? I'll use AS as an, as an example, just given the nature of our footprint and the types of businesses we have, the types of payments we make, and I guess the receipt side isn't as you know challenging. That's more information reporting. But it, it is, it really is a combination. I don't see a lot of the API, <laughs> the, the application being adopted. I can't speak for other companies, for, but for us, we, we do want to look to that, but there really is, given you know, what we talked about earlier about the urgency and the speed of things, it isn't necessarily just what we're using yet. Uh, I, w I do have you know, some thoughts about how we can innovate in that space and use that and use APIs. However, today it's just a combination of SFTP and uh, just those host to host connections. We've rationalized a lot of that to make it you know, as secure as possible, as efficient as possible and simple. So in terms of kind of the overall infrastructure and you know, connectivity points and systems, number of systems and counterparties involved. As Mark was saying, it really, it really depends on what your needs are and where you want to push and the re receptivity of adopting those types of solutions. So in our case, I should say that you can imagine AES more than likely works with a lot of banks globally. So we have that, you know, does it make sense to do APIs when, you know, it, are we working with large commercial banks or small local regional banks that may not have this? So it's blending, you know, what is the best solution to not only, you know, yes, we're going to maximize our effort to implement a more efficient structure and use these technologies. Also what's adding value. That makes sense. I think a lot of people are looking at this, these hybrid environments, not only where we work, the example of uh, COVID pushed people working hybrid. The fact that we're changing technologies, um, you know, maybe it was all host to host SFTP or it's portals. Now it's more SFTP or Swift or networks, the power of networks and, and APIs are starting to come into play. But like you were saying, Kelly, it's more on the very large banks are offering that capability. That's, it's becoming more commonplace now. So it's a, it's a shift. These things don't change instantly. And the other hybrid is, you know, power consumption. You know, it's like, okay, some of the older fossil fuels or coal or other forms of energy and some of the newer renewables. They're still in use. <laughs> they're, they're still in use. And these things, you know, on the energy side, it takes a really long time. On the technology side, it still takes far longer to switch new formats, new connectivity. So if, if you think about, you know, three or four years ago, you know, APIs with the hot 
you know, hot thing, open banking APIs. And, and, and you know, APIs have been around for a long time. They're in, they're in the smartphone usage and all of that. But, but as it relates to APIs within a treasury or finance organization, you know, relatively new thing. And, and so in an, in an odd way, the demand exceeds the supply. And by that, I mean, there's a huge amount of interest in APIs and how could they benefit me? But there's very few banks that really are connected in, other than the obvious ones, the JP Morgans of the world, uh, the Citibanks and, and, and Bank of America, et cetera. But if you're that organization that has banks outside of that, your other regional banks or just other banks that don't have APIs, of which, by the way, there's I think that's 70% of the banks around the world. The challenge there is time, you know, how long, and I've, I've no doubt that's the direction, APIs, the, the continual adoption by banks, and I think ultimately, if banks don't adopt digital strategies around APIs, they're going to be in trouble. Some have gone in and, and done clever things like become a nano bank and are doing some fascinating things, reviving themselves in that fashion. You know, so what do you do in the meantime? You're, you're still that corporate cu- corporate customer, or corporate treasurer, still need to be able to bank where I need to bank, and I still need to be able to get my real-time cash positions and report on that and make payments. And so, like you said, right, Cole, although I think, I, I'd like to think this is a less controversial sort of easy decision is to embrace technology as it develops itself and becomes more mature. Um, but I mean, that's the thing. You want to be able to meet your customers where they are today and then future people for it. Certainly from our perspective, we're, we're doing APIs, but we're, we can only go as fast as the banks and the banks are slow so far. And then the other problem with the APIs, of course, is if you've been involved with them, is the standardization is not the same. So each bank's API has a different set of standards, which makes it a sort of a challenge to work with the, there's no, it's not like VHS, you know, or Blu-ray, you know, when it came to the big beta versus VHS battle in, in the videotape business back in the day, um, you know, we still, it'd be nice to come to some sort of standardized way of enriching that data and sending that data down the pipe. I think you mean to say standardized standards. I like it. I like it. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Not the standards that are different. This has been a great discussion. I think I want to just hear any of your thoughts on a a future look. You know, as we think about connecting to banks, you know, what are the challenges there, whether it's for payments, validation, sanction filtering, or whether it's for information reporting with an increase of speed or, or, or activity. What are you seeing as the biggest change what do you think the biggest change will be over the next three years and maybe 10 years three years you know try to be more accurate 10 years we'll all have forgotten this podcast that by by that time before we talk about the future i think it's really important to to always know where you're where you are currently and if you don't know where you are standing today there's no way for you to know where you're going my team and our treasurer as we're thinking about of our strategy globally from a business perspective, as well as the treasury, what's our foundation? We need a solid foundation. We had talked about connectivity, like you really need the channels flowing. The pipes need to be open for information to flow freely and accurately before you can really take the next step. You can plant the seeds, but take the next step. So knowing where you're at and then start. So you also need that receptivity or just, you know, the openness to change, willingness to change. And I think in the future, in terms of, if we're talking about APIs or the use of SFTP, I think we kind of know the fate of SWIFT at this point. (laughs) Um, We've already started kind of moving away from more SWIFT base payments and using leveraging the the ISO or the XML format, which was an enhancement in our systems to, to make that seemingly simple shift, but it was a big lift for our technology teams and lots of testing. So I think where we're going in the future is maybe not being able to read people's minds and balance sheets. Uh, through telepathy, but I I do see perhaps API will be commonplace. Maybe it will not be a thing. I I can't really answer what it is going to be, but I see that there will be more focus definitely on the security, more focus on security and speed. We're going to see real time. This time lag is not going to be an issue. I I think... uh, 
we haven't necessarily talked about blockchain or I don't know if that's necessarily applicable, but things like that. Mark was saying that kids coming out of college, forgive me, ladies and gentlemen, people coming out of college, coming into these companies that are using you know, Microsoft Excel and they're walking out. Well, the point is that there needs to be kind of an openness to change and who are we allowing to drive that change? And is it the banks? Is it corporates? Is it companies like FIDA's? Is it our strategic treasure podcast? I'm not really sure. So I don't know how to answer that question with like a specific, like this is the fate of API or SFTP. It has to be a solution that's pretty much like fully integrated into everything we do. Some of the things I've heard you say, the the new workforce, um, you know, as you, as you certainly move through the process, what are, what are they expecting? And, and you, you joke about people leaving. Well, we have a, we have a staffing arm that does permanent and temporary staffing for companies for cash positioning management. And we've taken on some companies where people left because the process was so manual. It was like the stuff that Kelly was talking about that wasn't being done. It was extremely manual, pulling things out, entering into spreadsheets. And they're like, no way. You know, 10 years ago, people were like, I'll put up with this nonsense because that's the way life is. But if you grow up, you're like, key stuff in. Like, who's going to do that? And that's actually, that's fairly reasonable given the tech today. Like, why would you want to do that? That's not a career growth thing. And so we're staffing some of these companies that have run into those problems. And they're also like, help us automate those processes because now assistant treasurers are now having to do these very manual processes because they can't hire the Zoomers that come out of school today. like well, Everything, you know, Kelly was posing the questions and these are good questions and, uh, and, and just even having these conversations opens this up for the discussion and the debate. I mean, if I was to sum that up in the drive to everything new is two, two words or three, if you put them two together, user experience, um, you know, and the user experience is just the, the connection of everything where, you know, you use a phone or, or you get on a smart TV, the smart everything, the smart fridge. And the other word is connectivity, how all these things will talk to each other and integrate into each other and, and in a seamless, frictionless like way. And so, you know, as you think about treasury, I mean, if we could all know what the future would behold we'd probably be all very rich and wouldn't have to do podcasts we'd be sitting on an island somewhere having a mai tai but if i was to guess um you know over the next couple of years i'd expect to definitely see a continued growth in the use of apis for bank connectivity you know they're obviously more flexible they have some dynamic integration between systems and they're already doing that in many other uh ways in society today particularly on the consumer side so i expect that to continue i'll bet slowly but it's definitely coming and and you know people are getting geared up there and i think in the more you know five to ten years we, we we're seeing a bit of it now um but i think in the longer mid to longer term you know we're going to start to see <clears throat> you know further development and adoption around new technologies like the blockchain use of blockchain or artificial intelligence and in fact you know and the thing about these things is they're not they're not linear anymore they're exponential right so something like chat api has dropped on our laps only recently and and that's almost revolutionized. And Chat GBT. Chat, Chat GBT, rather. Thank you. <clears throat> Which is just um, could put whole sections of the industry out of work because the AI does it for you, you know. And so there's some considerations around that. And how do you, how do you harness the good in that? And, and then how do you protect, you know, job losses and things like that? So how, how do you take that technology and help you and your organization make better decisions, faster decisions, um, uh, um, predictive, more predictive nature to what you could be doing inside your business? I think that's the exciting tech. You know, that's, that's the common that's underway. Bear, bear with me as I just step through this. This is something that was coming up as I was thinking through what you guys were saying and discussing. Um, everybody remembers eBAM, right? There was this, the method of exchanging uh, bank account, electronic bank account management, the method of having digital conversations back and forth. That was a huge topic, a lot of buzz about it. And then the re- banks were setting it up and then the corporates are like, yeah, we really want that. But we maintain all our records on Excel spreadsheets or in paper files and you can't integrate digital into paper, right? It's like electronic water connection. Those don't work. And so people have been building up on the bank account management side. Now, the other thing that's going to happen, I think, over this three to three to 10 years is like everything's going to get faster. And, you know, when we think about APIs, 
you know, or, or some type of streaming, right? Things happen as they occur. It can be pushed instantaneously. It doesn't have to be mega connection, pass a file, close it, check to make sure it's balanced. It can, it can move quicker. And, and, you know, the APIs of the last five years are far superior to what, what we saw in the past. So here's one thing I'm, th- I'm thinking of. If you have any at- reactions or you just, you don't have to react to it if you don't want to, but I think what we're going to see is the larger banks are going to develop more APIs, much more real time. And then as we need to speed, as we need to increase speed, the challenge is going to be inside organizations. Mm-hmm. Now we have some companies that are working on internal streaming and this whole this whole exchange of information essentially instantaneous within their organization, even though their organization may be heavily cloud oriented between cloud partners, that you have to you can't say, I'm going to I'm going to be instant in a file based method to be instant, to be streaming. It's, it's a different type of connections and mate, that's not going to be in three years for most companies it won't be in three years, but it will be over time. Any, any reactions? Yeah, on well, that? I, 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 just think about that. Right. <clears throat> and then think about corporation to corporation or B to B and the, just the complexities that exist today. Now you layer in that faster, everything on top of that. And you got three things just, you know, scream out at me. Um, security, how do you maintain the security? I mean, that's still somewhat of an issue even with APIs. Am I in compliance? Also a big issue. Um, and then, you know, is it, uh, am I within regulations no matter what country I'm, I'm at? You know, so they have to somehow embed themselves into these new processes and say, I don't see, I see more of that coming on, not less. And, and I think it's weak on the consumer side, all of these issues. But inside corporations where you're dealing with vast amounts of cash and the protection is a fiduciary duty management Managing that cash and protecting protecting that cash, different different set of requirements. So the technology may be way ahead of operationally managing all of that, and then then you layer in sanctions filtering today. You know, a very hot topic. All these things that are need to somehow sit alongside whatever we do with faster, newer technology. Yeah, sanctions filtering a hotter topic today on the corporate side because they have more liability as opposed to the banks. Kelly, any any final words from uh, from you? I'll be curious to see, because I mentioned we do operating in many countries, some of them smaller than the U.S. I'll be interested to see how the larger banks or the larger players in developing these technologies or enhancing APIs and the security around that step in to help those smaller institutions with this. Because I can't imagine that customers globally will keep banking with smaller regional banks that don't have this type of, so I'll be curious to see how the industry, the banking industry evolves. Like, will we see more acquisitions? Will we see more partnerships? You're absolutely right. I think, you know, either you adopt these digital strategies as some of these smaller banks or you die, right? And, and I think, if you think about APIs and just newer technology, certainly like the APIs, I equated to like the ATM network back in the late 80s or early 90s. <clears throat> you know, the banks came up with this great idea with the network of the ATM. I can go to a hole in the wall, extract cash. I didn't have to go into the, inside the, the, the retail branch. And it was great for the banks because they could, you know, sadly lay off people inside the bank. Less, less need for resources inside the bank. And everybody got used to that for years and years and years. And it was very convenient. And it's back to that sort of idea of user experience, just that I could go anywhere, grab my cash. Before digital wallets came along, that was the thing, right? And then what did the banks do? They started charging fees. So APIs, I think, is is a great ubiquitous way to do a lot of the same thing, provide that user experience, that frictionless experience between corporates and finance departments and the banks themselves and offer new services along, along these new APIs. But at some point, you know, you'll turn on Presumably, you'll turn on the. Uh, you'll some. You have to pay for it, but but you'll be used to using it because you're using it in many different ways, and it's providing that sort of frictionless experience. Well, Mark and Kelly, thank you both for your time on on today's podcast. We really appreciate it. You've reached the end of another episode of the Treasury Update podcast. Be sure to follow Strategic Treasurer on LinkedIn. Just search for Strategic Treasurer. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only, and statements made by Strategic Treasurer LLC on this podcast are not intended as legal, business, consulting, or tax advice. For more information, 
Visit and bookmark strategictreasurer.com.